Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. How well do you know Jesus? How well do you know his Sermon on the Mount? Let's test your knowledge. Which of the following two statements did Jesus make in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21? Did Jesus say, Everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven? Or did Jesus say, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven? Contrary to popular belief, Answer number two, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. John MacArthur writes, Hell will be full of people who thought highly of the Sermon on the Mount. That st statement is also startling when you first read it. Why would a preacher make such a statement? People ordinarily think highly of Jesus and, as a consequence, think highly of the Sermon on the Mount. But heaven and hell are not designated merely by the kind of reviews one gives to Jesus and His great Sermon on the Mount. This becomes abundantly clear from what Jesus says as He winds up His message in Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. There is a fascinating contrast in these words and those immediately preceding them in Matthew 7, Verse 15 through 20, J.C. Ryle says, He turns from false prophets to false professors, from unsound teachers to unsound hearers. R.B.G. Tasker adds, It is not only false teachers who make the narrow way difficult to find and still harder to tread. A man may also be grievously self-deceived. This reminds me of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. Christendom today underestimates how central the Lord intended the role of obedience in the kingdom of God. I was stunned as I was traveling home through the Ozarks recently by what I heard on a syndicated religious radio program. The preacher, a two-time president of the Southern Baptist Convention, said... How many times did Jesus tell his disciples to obey him? How many? Right. He never said that to them. He went on to say, you would think, surely Jesus said you must obey me. He never said it. He was so wise. Listen, he didn't use that term. You know what he tells them? Trust me. Have faith in God. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. You know why he didn't talk about obedience? The preacher continued. Because he knew that if they trusted him, they would obey him. And he could say, obey, obey, obey all day long. But the bottom line is, trust and obedience go together. And so his emphasis to them was always, trust me. This particular program is on 500 radio stations and 300 TV stations. The preacher has all the earthly credentials, but he is mistaken about a fundamental Bible topic that we address here today. We'll let Jesus weigh in this morning on the Lordship of Christ. But first, enjoy our song.
The famous preacher we quoted saying, Jesus never told his disciples, obey me, went on to say, quote, Christians sometimes approach obedience as a way of avoiding the negative consequences of disobedience. They see obedience as a burden, not as the road to blessing. But God intended our walk of faith to be a great adventure motivated by our love for Jesus Christ. Obedience is about expressing our love for and trust in God, not about avoiding unpleasant consequences, end quote. Obedience is about expressing our love for and trust in God. But Jesus makes it clear in the Sermon on the Mount that obedience is also about avoiding unpleasant consequences. Our focus will be in Matthew 7, verse 21 through 27 this morning, but Jesus spoke frequently about obedience. When Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, he was emphasizing obedience, wasn't he? The same is true in Luke 6, 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the, do the things which I say? In his final days on earth, Jesus stressed obedience repeatedly in John 14 and 15. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 23 and 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. That's obedience. John 15, 10. <clears throat> if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. When Jesus issued the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 20, he focused heavily on obedience. He said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. At least seven translations read like the New Revised Standard Version that says, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. When we read Matthew 7, verse 21 through 27, we find Jesus preaching obedience as well. As important as it is to hear the gospel, Hearing without obeying is worthless. In verses 24 through 27, Jesus compares two builders who both appear at first to be on God's side. Both hear the Word of God. They represent people today who read the Bible, attend church, and listen to religious programming. They both look like you, don't they? Listen, being a Christian, a disciple of Christ, involves more than going to church and reading your Bible. In Jesus' story, all that separates the two men is that one does what Jesus says and the other does not. The one who obeys what he hears is like a man who builds his house on a rock. The one who does not act on what he hears is like a man who builds his house on the sand. Note, that this man is not antagonistic to Jesus' teaching. The man who fails to follow Jesus' teachings meets a catastrophic end. The obedient man does not. As far as we know, the man who met a tragic end may have approved or even applauded the message, but he did nothing about it. Clearly, we cannot hear our way into heaven. Jesus takes his argument another step. If directly confronted, Jesus' next pronouncement would make many professing Christians break out into a cold sweat. Most people assume all that is required for salvation is belief or faith. Faith is central to conversion, but some people never seem to get beyond John 3.16. Others recognize this faith must be expressed, but insist once one confesses faith in Christ, he has been guaranteed eternal life. Again, confessing faith in Christ is absolutely essential. Matthew 10, 32, Acts 8, 37, Romans 10, 9, and 10. But a verbal confession of faith does not seal the deal. Jesus must have known, though, that this error would be popular because he addresses it in such a frank manner in such a prominent place. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, beyond confessing faith in Christ, we must do the will of the Father. We must demonstrate that Jesus is truly Lord of our lives. There's an interesting and important phrase that's easy to overlook in this passage. Notice at the close of this uh, section, Jesus describes people who express faith in Christ, yet are rejected as those who practice lawlessness. What exactly does lawlessness mean? The definition, according to Thayer, is the condition of without law because ignorant of it or because of violating it. Contempt and violation of law, iniquity, wickedness. This should give pause to those repulsed by the idea of keeping the law of Christ. We read in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, as well as Galatians 6, 2. These people fit the category Jesus describes of those who practice lawlessness and to whom he will say in judgment, I never knew you. Depart from me. Chilling. So Jesus says, not only can you not hear your way into heaven, but neither are you able to talk your way into heaven. You cannot even preach your way into heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Then he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy or preach in your name? Notice that the key is not so much in who confesses Christ as in who Christ confesses. And Christ confesses only those who do the Father's will, those who obey. The people Jesus turned away so directly claimed intimacy with him, but they denied him by their disobedience. The Holy Spirit addresses the same sad situation in Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. God says we can deny him by our works or lack thereof. We can deny him by disobedience. As John Stott puts it, they profess Christ with their lips only and not their life. The bottom line, they called Jesus Lord, but denied his lordship by their life. Have you confessed Christ? If so, wonderful. But now, is Jesus truly Lord of your life? Be honest with yourself. Everyone wants Jesus as Savior. But people reject the straight and narrow in favor of the broad and easy way because they refuse to let Jesus be Lord. One problem people have today with denying Jesus' Lordship may be they have never truly understood the meaning of the word Lord. William Barclay writes in his book, Jesus As They Saw Him, quote, Of all the titles of Jesus, the title Lord be became by far the most commonly used, widespread, and theologically important. Jesus is called Lord well over 200 times in the letters of Paul. He goes on to write, The Greek word for Lord, kurios, is the word of domestic authority. It describes the authority of the father of the family. It describes the man who is, as he ought to be, master kurios in his own household. It is the regular word for a master as opposed to a slave. It is the regular word to describe the undisputed owner of any property. Kurios, Lord, very commonly describes the person who has authority to make decisions. It describes the commander who has the right to make military decisions. It describes the magistrate who has legal authority to pass sentence of death or to exercise his own judgment when the law is not clear or when the existing law does not cover the case. It, the same word, describes a law which is unalterable and unbreakable, a legal decision which is valid and binding, a treaty which has been ratified and whose terms must be observed, a decree which cannot be transgressed. 
kurios describes authority in every sphere of public life. Barclay continues on the word Lord. It can express moral authority. It describes the man who is able to win some moral victory. Aristotle, for instance, uses it to describe the man who has the strength of character and will never allow himself to become drunk. It can describe what English calls sovereign authority. Aristotle used it, for instance, of the sovereign power of the ecclesia, the governing body of the city of Athens. He continues, it is true to say that there is no Greek word in Greek so clothed with authority as kurios, or Lord, is. Kurios, he continues, gradually became the standard and official title of the Roman emperors. By AD 67 in Greece itself, Nero was being called Lord Kurios of the whole world. By the end of the first century, Greek and Roman emperors were referred to as Lord and God. Especially in the East, it became the standard title of every god. Zeus, for example, who is Lord of all. In the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament, kurios is the regular word used to translate Jehovah or Yahweh, the name of God. In the scriptures, we find both the common and sacred usage. The term is applied to the owner of a vineyard, Matthew 20, verse 8. The owner of a cult, Luke 19, 33. The owner of an estate, Galatians 4, 1. Master in relation to his servant, Matthew 6, 24. And a husband in relation to his wife, 1 Peter 3, verse 6. Each of these cases employ the term indicating human authority or respect. Barclay also writes, the words Messiah and kurios are intimately connected. Kurios, for Lord, was the regular title of the emperor. The Messiah is God's anointed king, and therefore kurios well expresses the majestic, imperial, kingly power of the Messiah and is therefore a fit title for Jesus in his messianic office. Much more could be said about this interesting word, Lord, as it's found in the Bible. But let us hasten on to the climax of Barclay's message. He writes, the Roman government made Caesar worship compulsory from one end of the empire to the other. They made it the bond which held the empire together. Once a year, a man had to come and burn a pinch of incense to the godhead of the emperor and to say, Caesar is Lord. That was a test of his loyalty as a citizen of the empire. And having done that, he could go away and worship any kind of god he liked. But that affirmation of faith in Caesar he must make. This is precisely what the Christians would not do. They would not take the name of Kurios and give it to anyone else in the earth or in heaven. For them, Jesus was Lord, and nothing would make them say, Caesar is Lord. And so they chose to die for their faith. And they died in the agonies of the cross, the flames, the arena, the rack. The difficulty for most Americans is not a hesitancy to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, but it's an unwillingness to truly live as if Jesus is Lord. It's not that believers will not let Jesus be Lord of some areas of their life. They can allow that. The issue is whether or not they will let Jesus be Lord of all. Listen, as Hudson Taylor puts it, if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. If we're going to recognize the Lordship of Christ, it will demand that we recognize his authority in every area of our lives. Making Jesus Lord requires obeying the commands that we like and the ones we don't like, the ones that are natural and the ones that are difficult, the ones that our friends and family accept and the ones that they reject. You must confess Christ. You will confess Christ one way or the other. You can do it now and get credit for it, 
Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32, Therefore, whosoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. If we ought, though, to deny him now, we will come clean on the great day. The Bible says in Romans 14, 10, and 11, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. This morning, have you confessed Christ? Have you obeyed the Lord in baptism for the remission of your sins? Acts 2, 38. Have you, no, you have not, as Jesus puts it, done the will of the Father until you have. Do you assemble with the saints every Lord's Day? Acts 20 and 7, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking, not neglecting the assembling of ourselves together. How can you say Jesus is Lord if you turn the Lord's Day into your day? The Lord is worthy of your time. The Lord is worthy of your worship, your devotion. Is Jesus really Lord of your life? Is Jesus Lord of your family? Is Jesus Lord at work, at home, at school? Is Jesus Lord of your entertainment and recreation? Is Jesus Lord on Saturday night? Hitler put German pastor Martin Niemöller in prison and concentration camps for eight years. Hitler knew if Niemöller, a First World War hero, could be brought over, then antagonism from churches would diminish. So he sent a former friend of Niemöller's who now supported the Nazis to visit him. Seeing Niemöller in his cell, the friend is reported as saying, Martin, Martin, why are you here? To which Niemöller responded, my friend, why are you not here? What about you this morning? Are you where you ought to be? Make Jesus the Lord of your life. We're here to help you. Stay with us after a song. We'll tell you how to get a free DVD copy of this message. Oh! 
glad you joined us this morning. We hope you will watch the program every Lord's Day and join us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. Call right for a free DVD of number 845, The Lordship of Christ. We're also offering a free copy of a recently published booklet, The Lord's Supper, Unity in One Loaf and One Cup. You may also request a free six-lesson Bible study by mail. We close with the words of the Apostle Paul from Romans 16, 16. The churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.